everyone, and welcome to Feeding His Sheep. Today, we're going to crack open that book of Obadiah. It might have a little hard time finding it. Just look for the book that's got all these clean, crisp white pages. There's no dog ears. There's no highlighting. There's no marks on it because that, that book is in there for a reason. That book of Obadiah, though it's the tiniest of the Old Testament, though it's small in size, God has it in there for a reason. So let's just unpack this thing and see what there is to it. And in this video today, we'll cover just a little bit more than the first half of it. And we're going to cover verses 1 through 12. Now, I think it may have been Chuck Swindoll that once said, the wheels of God's justice, they grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. Sometimes it just seems like wicked people get away with doing evil for way too long. The prophet Habakkuk wondered the same thing, and he cried out to God about it in his book. And when it comes to things like this, though, I'm thankful that God is God and we are not. You know, if we were in charge, we would probably send lightning boats down and strike somebody the very second that they committed some terrible, heinous sin. You know, James and John had this same attitude, and Jesus scolded them, and that earned them the nickname Sons of Thunder. But you know, our God is a God of grace. He is the God of second chances, and He is the God of third chances, and both you and I have depended and relied on those second and third chances many, many times. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, the Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The majority of the prophets in the Bible were either sent to Israel or Judah long before judgment was to come. And through the voices of these faithful servants, God essentially pleaded with his chosen people to repent and turn back to him before it was too late. And we know from history that they rejected all of those warnings and some of them even killed the prophets. And sure enough, judgment came and it came exactly as God had foretold it in chilling detail. The problem of most of the time is people tend to think that just because God is stalling in his judgment for a time, just because they've gotten away with it so far, they think judgment's never coming, as if God was somehow capable of forgetting what he said he was going to do. But sure enough, the promised punishment would always come, and it would usually fit the crime too. Every single time it was foretold with amazing clarity that only God has. He can see the future as easily as, or in fact, even better than we can see the past. Now, the book of Obadiah might be the smallest of the Old Testament prophets. It's the shortest of the 39 in the Old Testament, coming in at just 21 verses. You can actually read an entire book of the Bible in one sitting. Now, not only is this book unusual because of its length, but also because of its intended recipient. This time, God's not sending word to Israel. He is not sending a warning to Judah either. This is a warning to a nation that is distantly related to, but separate from the Israelites. Now, we aren't told when this book was written, but looking at the context, it's safe to assume that these events took place right after Judah was conquered by Babylon. So that puts the date somewhere between 586 BC to, I don't know, 550 or somewhere BC. So we don't know much about the author Obadiah either, other than his name means servant of Yahweh. That, and we haven't been saying his name correctly all these years. There is no B in the Hebrew language. The pronunciation is Ovadia, Ovadia, servant of Yahweh. So let us jump right in and let's see what this, what message God had sent his servant to deliver to this foreign nation. And there's only one chapter, so we'll just go ahead and cover verses one through four of this tiny book. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord and an envoy has been sent among the nations saying, arise and let us go against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations you are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the earth? Though you build high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord." As we said before, this time Israel and Judah are not the recipients of bad news. 
Bad news has already struck them at this point. This time, the coming wrath is focused on the nation of Edom. Now, you might be wondering, who are these people, Edom? You know, why should we even care? Let me begin by saying that every book of the Bible has been preserved for a reason. And what has happened in the past can and will happen in the future. If we don't take away some lessons or some morals of the story, those who don't know history are often doomed to repeat it. So back to this nation of Edom. If that name doesn't sound familiar to you, maybe you will recognize the name of the founding patriarch of their nation, Esau. Abraham's son Isaac married Rebekah, and they had twin sons, Jacob and Esau. The descendants of Jacob would become the nation of Israel, while Esau's family formed the nation known as Edom, who we're talking about today. And we'll get into their family history a bit more later on in this study, and it'll help us understand the animosity between Edom and Israel, and we're going to be told exactly why Edom is in trouble to be receiving the wrath of God in the first place place. Now looking at these four verses, we can see that the nation formed by Esau's family had lived in a natural fortress. It's a high mountain and apparently very rocky terrain. Now that would give any nation a huge advantage in times of war. Anytime that you have a higher elevation than your enemies and you're looking down upon them, you have an advantage. That and the terrain around them was too rocky and too treacherous. They couldn't bring up siege machines or any war horses to storm. Now, this likely gave the Edomites a sense of security. Maybe they'd started to feel invincible after years of self-reliance. They'd become, to put it bluntly, a really cocky group of people. They weren't very easy to get along with, and they rarely, if ever, did anyone any favors. You know, when God delivered Israel from Egypt and they were on their way to Canaan after the Exodus, the Edomites were really selfish and rude to the nation whose ancestor was the brother of their patriarch. And again, we'll cover even that in greater detail further into this study. But for now, let us take a look at verses 5 through 9 that further describe the judgment that Edom is about to fall under. Verse 5 says, If thieves came to you, If robbers by night, oh, how you will be ruined. Will they not steal only until they had enough? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Oh, how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasures searched out. All the men allied with you will send you forth to the border, and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. There is no understanding in him. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Timon, that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter." Now, according to verse 5 here, this looting of Edom by its enemies, it's going to be very thorough. It's going to be a complete looting. The Lord mentioned that normally looters would leave behind some gleanings, you know, small tidbits of leftovers behind. Maybe a few clusters of grapes here after they pillaged the vineyard or a few stalks of wheat here after they raided all of their crops. They would leave something behind, but not this time. They're going to take every single thing that can be taken. Now, Now, just you imagine a modern day version like this. Say someone's house was robbed. They took all the normal things that thieves would take, jewelry, computers, electronics, valuable silverware. I guess you could add groceries to that list today, given current food prices. But suppose those thieves didn't stop there. They take all of your cleaning supplies. They take all the light bulbs out of your house, all your toilet paper. They take the dirty laundry with your clothing. They take the dirty dishes. They take your salt and pepper shakers. They take your cat's litter box, literally leaving nothing behind. That's a taste of the level of judgment that Edom's going to receive. That and so much more. Verse 7 told about betrayal of all their friends. People they ate with, people they'd invited into their homes, people they trusted, everything including their acquaintances and their best friends will be taken from them as their friends betray them. Keep that in mind as we near part two of this lesson about the betrayal they get from those that they trust. 
Verse nine goes on to mention a great slaughter. Well, this is really rough because usually when another nation invades and conquers an enemy, they're gonna take many captives along with all of the loot. They view the people as an asset, as a commodity, and they would carry away a majority of the civilian population and make prisoners of war out of them, sometimes making servants and slaves out of them, as happened to Joseph, as happened to Daniel, as happened to many people throughout Scripture. So if there's to be a great slaughter among even the common residents of Edom, there must be a reason why this time the wrath is so great. Remember, God usually makes the punishment fit the crime. So let us see exactly what they did to deserve this coming wrath. Take a look at verse 10. Because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. As we said before, Jacob refers to one of the patriarchs of Israel. God actually changed Jacob's name to Israel at a certain point in his life. Now let us look back for a moment at a brief history of these two brothers who became two separate nations and therefore bitter enemies. And you're going to see that the problems had been there before these two people were even born. In Genesis 25, verses 21 through 23, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So Rebekah eventually conceived, and Esau was born first. Now Jacob had a hold of his heel on the way out, but Esau did come first. This is important. These two have been fighting even while they're inside the womb. You know, you can't help but feel sorry for Rebecca and whatever she had to endure all these months with these two inside her womb just fighting and duking it out. We think that our kids can be difficult at times. These two were even before birth and their families will be for hundreds of years after that they have passed. So Esau, whose descendants are the focus of this study, was named Esau because he was covered in hair when he was born. I mean, he was so hairy that they named him Harry, not like the English name, H-A-R-R-Y. I have an uncle by that name, but H-A-I-R-Y, which in Hebrew is Esau, covered in hair. Now, these two men grew up really differently from each other. Genesis 25 verse 27 says, When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. I love the comparisons that I've heard many pastors say on these two men. They usually all have the same comparisons and analogies, but some of their examples are different. You know, Esau was a man's man. Some people say he had this epic beard. He, he wore flannel all the time, you know, or he drove a four-wheel drive truck and has a bunch of guns and he listens to Waylon Jennings. And then you have people and pastors talking about Jacob. He's just a mama's boy. He's inside the tents watching HG. TV, you know, he's got a little man bun up there and he's listening to Justin Bieber on his headphones while he's trying out new recipes or listening to a Martha Stewart podcast. Of course, that's kind of modernizing the comparisons and such. But the basic point is these were two very, very different men. Obviously, the father, Isaac, is favoring the manly one and the mother is, of course, favoring the mama's boy. Their favoritism did nothing but fuel the competition and the division between these two siblings. That's a warning to all of us who are parents or who will one day become parents. Never show favoritism among your children. This can carry on throughout the generations, you know, from way past when we're gone. Even though there probably is one that you like more than the others, and there's another one that's in your family that you want to sell them to the gypsies or whatever, never let that preference come out to the open. One of the kids asked my wife one time, which one of us do you love more? And she looked at them. She goes, what makes you think we love any of you? <laughs> of course, we're just kidding. We love our children. But oh, you should have seen a look on their face when we said that. The favoritism that Isaac and Rebecca showed towards Esau 
and Jacob came to a head one day. Esau made a rash decision that changed the course of history for all of his descendants and the Edomites who we're studying about now in the book of Obadiah. Esau had gone out one day hunting all day long and he had no luck. He came back home and he's just starving and he smells something delicious that his brother was cooking. Genesis 25, 30. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there for I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Yeah, I've never heard it in this translation. I'm reading from the NASB, which is usually one of the most accurate to the original text. And I'm interested to know what everybody else's translation says. Let me have a swallow of that red stuff there. I mean, how raw and common can you get with your speech? He don't even know what type of stew it is. Now, other translations will say it was a lentil stew. You know, it had beans to it. The fact that it was red, maybe it was had some kind of tomato base. I don't know. I'm not a Jacob. I'm not a Cook. But I like that. Just let me have a swallow of that red stuff there. And it says, therefore, his name was Edom. Edom in Hebrew means red. He was already called hairy because he was born a hairy child right off the bat. And he already had a reddish tone to him, some commentators say. But his desire for this red stew and his willingness to do anything for it earned him the name red or Edom from then on. Now, Jacob, his brother, pronounced Yaakov, also had a name to it. It means deceiver. Remember that as well, because that's going to come out in a future verse. But after a later encounter with God, Jacob is renamed Israel, which means governed by God. So out of these two babies that were fighting inside the womb, we have red and we have governed by God. So Jacob told him that he could have some of this stew for a price. Esau's birthright. Esau's probably thinking, what are you talking about? My birthright? Has anybody ever seen the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Where the one fellow had sold his soul apparently to the devil to learn how to play the guitar. And one of the guys says, oh, you sold your, your everlasting soul to learn how to play the guitar? And the guy says, well, I wasn't using it. Well, this is Esau's attitude right there. He says, what good will that birthright do me if I'm dead from starvation? You know, talk about dramatic. Now, us men can be really, really dramatic when we're hungry. So he basically told Jacob, you've got a deal. And he traded his birthright for a bowl of stew. Now that might sound odd to us nowadays. You know, what exactly is a birthright? Well, let's tear that down. There are three components to a birthright. And I promise all of this has a point with Obadiah. The first component, the firstborn son, according to the Mosaic law, receives a double portion of the father's estate when he dies. He has a double inheritance. When things get divided up, the firstborn gets twice as much as anybody else. The second thing about a birthright, before the father dies, he usually prays a blessing over his son. As we see in the case of Israel's patriarchs, these blessings must have been of God because more often than not, they actually came to pass. And then the third component of a birthright is when their father did pass, the one who had the birthright which is 99 out of 100 times the firstborn, would become the new patriarch of the family, the new leader, the new head of the family. And Esau just flippantly sold all that away for a bowl of red bean stew. He traded a long-lasting blessing for something quick and something temporary. Now, I know hunger is a real issue. Snickers has capitalized on this with their commercials. You're not yourself when you're hungry. Uh, Esau could have waited for something else. We know that they had livestock that could have been eaten, but he couldn't wait. He wanted what Jacob had, and he wanted it right now. And then he didn't even think twice about what, what it was going to cost him. You know, he must have not have believed that Jacob was being serious, because apparently neither sibling let their father Isaac be aware of the deal. Either that or Isaac knew, and he just didn't care, because he was going to bless his favorite child regardless. So one day, it was, you know, years later after that, I Isaac declared that he felt as if he was going to die, and he told Esau to go and fetch some wild game for him, and he would give him the paternal blessing afterwards. Here we go again. Once a man is sick, he gets you know all kinds of melodramatic here. I'm going to die. You know, go get me some meat, and, I, and I'll give you the blessing afterwards. 
even though that should now go to Jacob since Esau traded it, you know, earlier for a bowl of beans. Well, Rebekah heard about this and she told Jacob, hurry, go out and kill a couple lambs and I'm going to get busy preparing Isaac's favorite dish. Meanwhile, you take the skin from those goats out there and disguise yourself to resemble Esau. Now, their father Isaac was mostly blind, but he could still hear he could still feel somebody that grabbed their arm and he could still smell pretty good. Now, Jacob, he covered his arms and he covered his neck with the goat skin so that he would feel like his brother when his dad took him by the arm or placed his hand upon his neck to hug him or something like that. And I have to ask, Exactly how hairy was Esau? What in the world did this guy look like if you could touch a goat and think it's your son? I mean, come on. But when he had the goat skins in place so that he would feel like his brother when his father touches him, he also put on his brother's clothes so he would smell more like him. I imagine his mother decided it wasn't enough. Uh, no, Jacob, you smell like cinnamon and you've been baking cookies all day. Go out and roll in the dirt. Get some cedar brush and rub it all over you so you smell like you've been out hunting. Of course, this is paraphrased, you know, but Jacob walks in and he's like, here I am, dad. Oh, here I am, dad. And Isaac says, I, do my ears deceive me? This sounds like Jacob, you know, but I asked for Esau. He says, come here. And he grabbed his arm and placed his hand upon him and he felt the goat. And he says, well, okay. The, the voice is, sounds like Jacob, but the skin feels like Esau. And he leaned forward and he smelt him and he smelled the clothing, which had been outdoors and everything. He goes, okay, it's my son. So Isaac gave Jacob the blessing thinking it was Esau. And he said in that blessing that all the family is going to serve him and he would be master over all in the family. Now, no sooner than that happened, he had walked out. Esau come back from hunting. He goes, here you go, dad. I, I've got my stew. And I wonder if he ever, if he caught Jacob dressed up in his clothes and covered in goat skins. He's coming back with this meat, all excited, ready to feed his dad and receive the blessing and become the patriarch of the family. Then he sees his brother with these goat hides, you know, tied to him with cord. He's like, what is my weirdo brother up to now? Anyway, I, I don't even care. It's time to get the blessing. Then he finds out the news that his brother, who legally has the birthright, has already received the blessing. Genesis 27, verses 34 through 36. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me even also, O my father. And he says, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Then he said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Blessing. And he says, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Remember that Jacob meant deceiver? Well, in actuality, he didn't deceive Esau. Esau sold that birthright fair and square. It was his father Isaac that Jacob deceived. But at the same time, you know, Esau, the truth didn't matter. He now wanted blood. It didn't matter that he had actually co consented to giving away the birthright. He wanted blood. Genesis 27, 41 brings us to where we are in Obadiah. It says, so Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. And this is where that long lasting feud between nations began. Now, if you would finish off the book of Genesis, you will, know, you will know that Jacob had deceived his father and everything, but later made up with Esau. Now we say Jacob deceived his father, but Jacob shouldn't have had to. Esau sold that fair and square. Isaac was in the wrong for wishing to give it to Esau regardless whether he knew about the deal between the brothers or not. So at the very root of it, it was Esau. Had he not sought to satisfy, satisfy his flesh at the expense of longer lasting, more important things, we wouldn't have had this to begin with. You'd be reading about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. That just sounds odd, doesn't it? Because we're so used to it this way. But that's another sermon for another day. This was all to remind you of the intensity of the animosity and the ferociousness between Israel and Edom. 
Now, of course, like I said, later on in Genesis, Jacob and Esau make amends. They buried the past. They forgave each other. But that didn't matter to their families and to future generations. You know, the future generations either forgot about the reconciliation or they didn't care. Now, remember this. This is another lesson as well. Whenever you have an argument with someone or a dispute with someone and you make that public, whether you do it in person or whether you blast it all over social media, which is is never a good idea. There is such a thing as residual damage. Everyone around you that you're friends with has listened to your complaints. They've heard the negativity and now they're going to forever hold a grudge against that person, whether you have forgiven them and still hold a grudge or not. Because people take sides in their minds and in their heart. And some people, once they've taken a side, they just cannot let that go. These brothers, they could forgive each other because they had common ground. They had common roots. They would probably talk about the times they were growing up and playing and hide and seek or remember something funny that Isaac had done or something Rebecca had done. They had common things that they could get back together on and they made peace with each other. But their children, their grandchildren, their servants, their, their friends, they didn't feel the brotherly bond that Jacob and Esau had at the end. They just held on to the hate and the Edomites never let that hate go as long as they live. So here we are, many centuries later, and they're still at it. So God steps in and sends Obadiah to tell them that he has had it with this mess. It's gone on for way too long. And when the wheels of justice finally get to the Edomites, it's going to be in the era of the New Testament. And we're going to get to that in the second half of this study. The Edomites were still causing trouble, even in the Christmas account surrounding the birth of Christ. But let us move on and cover just a few more verses, and we're going to begin looking at a list of charges against that generation of the Edomites that pushed God too far. This is going to begin to unfold for us to see. We'll cover verses 11 and 12 in closing. On that day that you stood aloof, on that day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune, and do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress." At the time of this prophecy, Babylon had just overthrown Judah and Jerusalem, and they began carrying people off to Babylon as prisoners. Now, what did Edom do the whole time while this was taking place? They stood there. They're laughing. They're rejoicing. They did a little happy dance, and they're like, Hi, karma, you deserve every bit of this, Jacob. Oh, you people of Israel, you deserve this. God said in verse 11, When you stood there aloof, you were as one of them. They were just as evil as the people who were doing the raiding and the burning the buildings and killing and capturing people. So they were guilty by association and guilty by disassociation at the same time. You see, not taking action is a sin. Not helping someone when you have the means, when you have the ability and you don't help them, that is a sin. You know, not only are there sins of commission, that means you did something you shouldn't have, have, but there are sins of omission. That means you didn't do something that you should have. And there are plenty of places in the Bible that warn against that. As Edom failed to lift a hand for Israel each and every time, sometimes they even raised a hand against their brother Israel. I think, for example, the time when God delivered the nation of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. They're on their way to Canaan. They're on the way to the promised land that was given to Edom's grandfather, Abraham, the promised, the promised land for them. And they had to pass through Edom to get there. Let's look how that turned out and what Edom said in did. We're in Numbers chapter 20. We'll go ahead and begin in verse 14. From Kadesh, Moses then sent messengers to the king of Edom. Thus your brother Israel has said, you know that all the hardship that has befallen us, that our fathers went down to Egypt and we stayed in Egypt a long time and the Egyptians treated us and our fathers badly. But when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us from Egypt. Now behold, we are at Kadesh, a town on the edge of your territory. 
Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or through vineyard. We will not even drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway, not turning to the right or to the left until we pass through your territory. Edom, however, said to him, You shall not pass through us, or I will come out with the sword against you. In verse 19, he tried again. Again, the sons of Israel said to him, We will go up by the highway, and if I or my livestock do drink any of your water, then I will pay its price. Let me only pass through on my feet, nothing else. Verse 20 says, But he said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against him with a heavy force and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to allow Israel to pass through his territory, So Israel turned away from him. And all those years later, here in Obadiah, we see the hatred remains. All of these generations have forgotten about the peace between the brothers, the patriarchs of Edom and Israel. Nothing remains but the hatred, that residual damage that we must be careful not to pass on to others. So this will become a lesson for the Israelites, though. When they do begin to take over the land, remember there were two and a half tribes that said they wanted to stay on the east side side of the Jordan River. The promised land was on the west side. I think it was Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh, two and a half tribes. They said, you know, this is really beautiful land. It's good. It's perfect for our livestock. We've already driven out the kings and the people here. Can we just leave our our women and our livestock here and then go and help you take over the land and then we'll come back here after all this is over? Moses told him, said, okay, you can do that, but on one condition. And this promise is found in Numbers chapter 32. He told them that they must still be willing to take up arms and come to the aid of their brothers whenever they get in a war. And he told them, he says, because if you do nothing to come to their aid, be sure that your sins will find you out. You know, then there's Job, the oldest book in the Bible, scholars say. He even made mention of that same principle when all of the calamity and the afflictions came upon Job. He lost everything. He's covered in sores and he's sitting in an ash heap, scraping the sores, hoping for some kind of relief. He prayed to God to examine his heart and see if he had unknowingly rejoiced at the fall or the calamity of his enemies. He said, I know I've never prayed for their destruction, but just search my heart and see if I've ever rejoiced when they have fallen. In James 4, 17, it even backs this up. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So not only did Edom not lift a finger to help their distant relatives, we find in these verses, they rejoiced in their destruction. You know, God isn't happy when you are happy about something bad happening to someone just because you don't like them. Even if that person does deserve whatever's happening to them for whatever reason, do not rejoice in that day. Proverbs 24, 17 and 18 says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, or the Lord will see it and be displeased and turn his anger away from him. If God sees you laughing at your enemy when they're going through tough times, he's going to take that wrath away from them. And the chance is what he was giving to them, he may now give it to you. I remember one time when I was in grade school, we're at a baseball game and one of my friends was sitting down in the middle of the bench and I wanted to ask him something. I don't even remember what it was now, but he couldn't hear me because of the roar of the baseball game. So I picked up a tiny piece of gravel and I just kind of flipped it down there and it landed in front of him. I was trying to get his attention, grabbed another little rock and I flipped it just a little bit more and it hit the leg of the guy sitting next to him, a guy that did not like me. A guy that didn't like anybody for that matter. Next thing I know, he found a rock the size of a baseball and it's coming at my head at high speed and then the fight was on. Well, later on, we're in the principal's office and we both told our sides to the principal and it was determined that, hey, he was the aggressor and I intended no harm to anyone whatsoever. I was trying to just simply gently get the attention of one of my friends and it accidentally hit his leg instead of the other. So the principal told that bully, he says, you grab the desk. And back in those days, schools weren't scared to spank someone with a wooden paddle. That kept all of us kids in line. We called it the Board of Education. We feared that paddle. 
So I'm sitting here watching as that bully grabs the desk and the principal proceeds to light him up. And that was the first time in my life I'd seen this big macho guy start to cry. He's hopping around and holding his rear end with both hands. He's bouncing around like he's on fire. He's yelling at the top of his lungs and I could not hold back the laughter at this sight. This big tough guy is reduced to tears, bouncing around, holding his bottom. Now in the middle of my laughing fit, the principal stops whipping him and he turns around and he tells the guy to go back to class. Then he told me, you get over there and you grab the desk and you take his place since you think it's so funny. So the point that we take away from our first half of the study in Obadiah is number one, that we should help out whenever we can, regardless of our emotions, whether or not we like the person. If someone needs your help, help them. And number two, we should never, ever laugh at someone that we don't like when they get into trouble or when they get into affliction, lest we receive the trouble or affliction that they were getting. Esau did. It's like that principle did many years ago. God basically just told Esau, oh, you think that's funny what's happening to Judah? What happened to your brother Jacob? Well, okay, they're about to be free to go. Their bondage is going to end and you are next. And the next time, I mean, the time would come when Israel's going to come back to their land. Their captivity is only gonna last for 70 years, for one generation. And when that's done, they're gonna come back. They're gonna rebuild. They're gonna restore the temple. But what's coming for Esau saw, is it going to be as pretty as what happened to the nation of Judah? So join us next time as we conclude what happened to them in the end. We're even going to look at the more evil things that the Edomites did to Israel. Essentially, they were kicking them while they were down. We're going to also see a promise of God concerning the millennial kingdom to come. We're even going to see a part of the Christmas story in which the Edomites were there sinning against God and Israel. And we're going to read the pronouncement from God that's about the complete and total elimination of the Edomites and we're going to look at it in a way that it was fulfilled and it's very ironic in the way that it come to pass and as the way it was described in Obadiah in chilling detail all of this out of this little tiny book of Obadiah just 21 verses so join us next time as we finish this tiny but amazing little book of prophecy